Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Hope City. My name's Peter. I'm the pastor here at Hope City Church. Glad you guys are here today. You have joined us on an incredible day where we're beginning a brand new series called Stuff They Didn't Teach You in Sunday School. You know, maybe you watched that, uh, that bumper video and you saw some of the questions, and um, we are going to grade you, so like you can turn in your answers afterwards. Um, I'm just kidding. But uh, you might have been able to answer all of them, some of them, uh, thanks to your Sunday School background. And then others of you were like, I don't even know what Sunday school is. That's like, were you like an overachiever? You went to school six days a week? Who knows? But um, anyway, like I said, we're glad you're here. We're going to be spending the next four weeks taking a look at some of the most popular Sunday school stories of all time. But here's, my goal is very simple. I'm just going to lay it out there in the very beginning. My goal is simple because I hope to help each one of us see how an ancient story, so those stories that were rooted in Sunday school, has timeless truths, how they affect us um, even right now, even today. So um, speaking of Sunday school, how many of you remember Sunday school? Raise your hand if you remember going to Sunday school. It probably looked a little bit like this. Um, you know, you had three women who were, I mean, there's just no other way to say it, old. They were, they were just old, right? And, and then there was like all of these, these little kids, and they were probably dressed in their Sunday best. And, and Sunday school, for those of you who avoided the pleated pants and the, the bow ties and the, the suspenders, Sunday school was an hour before big church happened. So everybody would go off to their, their rooms and they would spend time there before big church took place. And, and so um, they would, it was this time, this kind of key time during the week where everybody would gather together and they would learn about the stories from the Bible. Now, one of my Sunday school teachers used to give us pieces of candy to help us, uh, you know, to help you know, and motivate us and get us to do things. How many, remember the sword drill? Does anybody remember doing sword drills? Sword drills, if you were like sitting like a good disciple in your, in your seat, they would say, okay, here's what I want you to do. Everybody put your Bible above your head. This was back when you brought a Bible to church. And so you would put this Bible above your head and then the teacher would say, okay, we're gonna need to turn to Romans chapter three, verse eight. And then whoever, she would say, go, whoever found Romans three, verse eight first stood up and read it to the entire room and they would get a piece of candy. It was the greatest moment of all Sunday school. Like you aspired to be that guy to get that piece of candy in Sunday school because that was the pinnacle of the day. And so today we're going to not have an old-fashioned sword drill. I'm just kidding. But everybody's going to get a piece of candy. So um, if you ushers could get, you know, give people some candy here because I want to remind you, I want you guys to actually taste what Sunday school tastes like. They, I don't know if you know this, but they patented it. They figured out what Sunday school tastes like and they put it in a candy. That's right. It's Werther's original. Like if you're, if you're wondering what old tastes like, it's that. It, it's, it's that candy in your hands right now. Uh, and so like they've patented the Sunday school taste and, and it's in your hands being passed around right now. But while you're getting your candy, and don't miss out, you can enjoy that right now. <laughs> or not enjoy it, but still eat it. So while you're getting that, I just want to say from the beginning of this, this entire series, to set the record straight, that if Mrs. Bartram or Mrs. McGuire or anybody else is tuning in online right now, I want you to know that I'm incredibly grateful for the years that I spent in Sunday school, that the foundation that it laid in my life was huge. It's, it's monumental. To, it's shaped who I am today. However, I wonder if all we did is growing up, if we just learned the stories of, of what was done in the Bible, and yet we missed out on some of the backstory, what was happening behind the scenes. See, I'm grateful for Sunday school, but I think that we need to admit that Sunday school may not have taught us everything. For example, if there was ever a question in Sunday school, what was always the answer? Just say it. Jesus, that's right. You know it, right? So the teacher could be like, all right, boys and girls, who fed the 5,000? Oh, 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 Jesus, right? And you were probably right. Then they would say, hey, boys and girls, who healed the blind man? Oh, oh, I got this. I got it. Jesus. So who led the Golden State Warriors to beat the Cleveland Cavaliers? Oh, Jesus. No, you're wrong. It wasn't Jesus. Come on. Like, and that affectionately has become known as the Sunday school answer. But the answer that we just kind of blurt out when things we don't really know what the answer is, it's you just say, Jesus, and you're taking a stab in the dark that, you know, probably you'll be right. But I wonder if any of you remember, remember these. This, do you guys remember this? You know what this is called? This is a flannel graph, speaking of Sunday school. Boys and girls went to church, and for years, this was the primary um, method of teaching 
Bible stories was you would take this flannel graph board and they would print all these different things and you could change the story. You could change the scene and it was like as interactive, it was cutting edge. Like literally, some woman spent forever cutting the edges of this. And so then they would go to church They would experience just a a great day at church, and they were met by their pastor, right? Like, this was their pastor. That's a fine, that's a respectable pastor right there. I just got to say it. Like, he's got some serious shoes on. He's got his three-piece suit, a tie. It's all, you know, hitched up nice and tight. And mom and dad would bring their kids to church because they wanted them to come, and they wanted them to learn the stories of the Bible, And so these kids, again, kids were always, they were better back then. They had suits on and things of that nature. And and you can even see in this, there's pleated. Like you can see the pleated pants this kid has on, unfortunately. Uh, And this girl over here, you know, they're ready to go to church. Like they're serious about this business. They're going to show up to church. And here's what I want to point out too. (laughs) We got to call this out. I don't know why, but they're all white. Like they're always white. And can we just talk about this? Like, Jesus was Middle Eastern, and yet why are we printing them all like this? But that's another issue. We can take that up with um, 1970 version of of Bible uh, Bible school. So this was the scene, and all these kids would come to church, and they would learn the stories of the Bible. But there's one problem here. The problem is that the stories that were printed and put on the flannel graph were only ever the highlights It was only ever the stories like the biggest and the best, right? It was only those stories that that we would would celebrate because something miraculous happened or something extraordinary took place. But stories of scripture were posted on boards like this by dedicated teachers week after week. And we grew up knowing the stories and the characters. But I wonder, I wonder if we know what's going on behind the story which is where this whole series got birthed. The stuff they didn't teach you in Sunday school. Today, I I have a bunch of, uh, a hunch that some of our understanding of the biblical story, quite honestly, is is just as flat as this flannel graph stuff is. Like our understanding of of biblical characters is about that deep, and and we don't see or recognize that they're they're actually real people who had real emotions, who went through real situations. I mean, like if you take a look at this pastor guy, like, it is, it's unbelievable. The hair, the comb over, all this stuff. Like, I, I don't understand what's going on here, but we have made it so that everything is just so flat, so clean. And the reality is that, that life just, just isn't quite that clean. That life, there is so much more to the, the, just the Sunday school answer. See, one of the stories that we have to talk about, and I think it's, it's critical, that some of you are sitting in this room right now, and you've been on the edge of your seat deciding whether or not you're going to get involved here at Hope City, whether or not you think that your life matters, whether or not you can make a difference in this world. And because of something that may have been taught to you or something you may have heard, that it leaves you wondering if your life actually makes a difference. See, the story is, is that story of Moses. Moses was, was this guy who did some incredible things for sure. Moses is, is a man in the Old Testament, and his story is found in Exodus and, 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 and other places. And, and Moses, some of his story is so key because we remember Moses from something like this. This is a bush. For those of you sitting in the back, you should just sit up front, okay? That's all I have to say about that. I'm not even going to make any excuses. I know who you are. All right. See, Moses, that's a bush. And, and what happened was Moses was walking through the desert one day, and the bush caught on fire, caught on fire, but yet it didn't burn to the ground. Like you and I, we go out back and let's be honest, we don't do it in Florida, but um, if you were to have a fire, um, it would consume the wood and this bush does not get consumed. And what happens next is amazing. God speaks to Moses through this bush. God speaks to Moses in an incredible way. And God tells Moses this thing, that I have anointed you. Your life is going to be on mission for me, live on mission for me. And he says this, Moses, when you become old, Here's old Moses. I want you to go and you're going to talk to the most powerful figure in all of human history. And that was Pharaoh. Pharaoh was the king of Egypt at the time. And Pharaoh was the one that was over the nation of Egypt. But the nation of Egypt had subdued the Israelites, the people of God. And they put them into into captivity and slavery. And he said, you know, Moses, I'm going to go there. You're going to go speak to them. And you're going to tell them to let my people go. 
And then God told him that you're going to have this incredible interaction. There's going to be 10 plagues, and you're going to witness some amazing things that I'm going to do to change the heart of Pharaoh. Well, not only did he change Pharaoh's heart, but God did something else incredible through Moses. God brought the entire Israelite nation through the Red Sea, not around it, not over it, but through it. God parted the waters of the Red Sea. Moses held his staff up. The waters parted, and the entire nation, hundreds of thousands, millions of people, walked across on dry land. Mountaintop moments in Moses' life. But not only that, there actually was a mountaintop moment where Moses received the Ten Commandments from God. You know, kind of the the big ten of the Old Testament, or those thou shalt nots. And Moses has handed these, and he said, go deliver these to the people. A big kind of, you know, big moment. And then, of all things, like I just was even reminded of this this week as I was studying his story. Moses was the original church planner. Like, it's not us, it's not you know, any, it's not any of the other churches in our area. Moses was one of the first church planners because God spoke to Moses and he said, I'm giving you the responsibility of building the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the first place that God's spirit came and dwelt on earth in, in, a, in the church, in the setting where people could come and worship him. God was known. His presence was in this place, in the tabernacle. At the end of the lesson, my Sunday school teacher would say something like this. I want you to go and be like Moses. And you're like, what? How do, how do you figure I'm going to be like Moses? Like, I set things on fire and they burn down, right? Like, I'm a little kid. Like, I, I, don't, I don't spend any time with dignitaries. Like, the closest I've ever been is in the principal's office. I, and, like, I don't, like, water does not part. The low tide does not count for me. Like, it, it just, it doesn't happen. How can I go and be like Moses, right? See, the pages of the flannel graph have left us looking at people, at some of these biblical characters and saying, I'm nothing like that. And not only am I nothing like that now, I'll never be anything like that. See, Moses did all these incredible things over the course of his life, but I want you to imagine that Moses' story is not just these highlights, Moses' story actually is a lot more like you and me than you may have been taught or may have been told. And maybe it's a long time since you've spent any time in the beginning of his story where it all kind of came to pass. See, over the course of years, uh, we know the story through Sunday school, but after teaching these stories, what if, what if we're missing out on the very beginning, the foundation of who Moses is? I want you guys to turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 1. That's on page 39 in the Bibles around you. Uh, Feel free to take that Bible home. That's for you if you need one. Um, Or we've got them here every week for you. As well as you can click over in your YouVersion app, which is uh, a great app on 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 your smartphone. Love for you to join us at Exodus chapter 1. And we see the beginning of Moses' story. Verse 8, it says this, Then a new king came who came to pass to whom Joseph meant nothing. He came to power in Egypt and said, look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they'll become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they'll join our enemies and fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. See, here's what's taking place. Here's what's happening. What's happening right now is that Moses, there was a time when he was just being born. Right before he was born, actually, Pharaoh, he looks around and he sees all of the Israelites, how they're becoming so numerous. And he has this fear. He's like, if something happens, if they get angry with us, they actually could take us over. There's so many of them that if they were, there was a war to break out, we could lose. So what am I going to do? I'm going to put them into slave labor. We're going to have them build the cities, the great cities of Egypt, Pithom and Ramses. By the way, I know these are pyramids, but we're going to pretend. We're going to have our Sunday school imagination on today. And so this is Pithom and Ramses, the cities that were built by the backs of the Israelites. But it doesn't stop there. Things continue to get worse for the Israelites. Verse 15, it says this, The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Puah, 
First off, time out. Like, if you're going to have kids one day or you're, you know, you're thinking of names for kids, just you can scratch these two off the list. This is like the worst names in the Bible right here. Uh, you know, Pua. Like, who even thinks of that? But, so he says this to the Hebrew midwives. <clears throat> when you're helping the women, the Hebrew women, during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. It's incredible. The midwives, however feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. And they let the boys live. See, don't miss what's happening. Don't just flannel graph the, this story of the Bible. Pharaoh is introducing, at this point in time in history, a national genocide. The type of things that, that we look back on with shame in history. Pharaoh is introducing this. He's going to, he's going to breed out the Israelite nation. So that there was no more, the, the, the male race would be extinct and then they could adopt all these, these Hebrew women into their Egyptian culture. And they wouldn't lose their people base, but they would breed out the threat by just killing them, by, by cutting them off, by, by creating an extinction. Pharaoh was creating this, this tragic and nasty environment. And in the midst of this moment, Right in this is when Mo Moses is born. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. It says this, Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she couldn't hide him any longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, coated it with tar and with pitch, and then she placed the child in it, put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile, and his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. See, guys, life got so bad, like so bad for this young mother, where she couldn't imagine, like, what would happen if my three-month-old starts crying in the middle of the night, and like an Egyptian soldier walks by. I can't picture what would take place. She got to the point in her life where she said, it would be better for me to weave a basket out of paper, like out of papyrus, those things that, that they would make paper out of, to kind of do some kind of origami trick and make a basket, place it in the water so that I could put my kid in that basket. Like I could put everything that's precious, everything that's important to me in this basket. And then she said to her daughter, I want you to go and I want you to just sit and watch what's happening. Would you watch Moses? I actually have a hunch. Scripture doesn't tell us his name yet. Why? Because I doubt that Moses' mom even thought he was going to live. Like, this is the environment that Moses is brought into. This is the world that he's experiencing. And I wonder... In this type of moment right here, where it, they're so far gone, they're like, we don't even know what's going to happen. That they're so dependent on God because it's outside of their control. That they feel like it just couldn't get any worse. I wonder if some of you in this place right now, you're, you've reached a point in time in your life where you feel completely and utterly dependent on God. Like where you feel like you are incapable of doing anything else. Maybe you've put all of your dreams, all of your hopes, all of your aspirations into a basket and you said it would be better for it to drown in a river than for me to watch it die in front of me. See guys, before we think that Moses' life was just all mountaintops and like extraordinary experiences, we need to remember where it all began. See, if we're not careful comparison can sneak in. My Sunday school teacher's voice can be heard in the back of your head where you're like, go and be like Moses. And you're like, no, I, I couldn't ever be like Moses. And the problem is when we compare ourselves, it can cause us to be callous to what God is doing in us. And it's easy to say, I've never stood on a mountain with God. I've never you know, held up a staff and parted a sea. I've never done anything like Moses. And yet my life has been filled with pain and heartache and it's been filled with failure and wondering God may not want to use me then. Or maybe you would tell yourself, like, my life just really doesn't matter. Or I don't think I have anything to add. I have no value in this place. See, when we compare ourselves, 
We derail ourselves. This is our first point today, that comparing ourselves actually derails ourselves. When you look at yourself in, against somebody else, you are now putting yourself in a different position, and we focus on what others are doing rather than what God is doing in us. We put ourselves in a position to just totally miss out. And yet Moses' life, Moses' own life, it started off as turbulent and as out of control and painful as it possibly could be. See, maybe, just maybe, this feels like the part of Moses' story that we actually can relate to. Maybe this is the part of the story where we're like, this is me. Like, I'm going through this right now. When I was a younger pastor, and I, I know some of you in the room are like, could, could you get younger than this guy? Um, when I was a much younger pastor, uh, just starting out, I was trying to figure out my way. I was trying to, you know, be the best I could and be the best communicator, et cetera, all these kinds of things. And so I would listen to all these other people. You know, it's like whatever industry, whatever career you have, whatever you're doing, when you look at somebody else and you mimic, you kind of apprentice yourself after them. Well, I was doing that. I was doing that. I was listening to all these incredible communicators like Bill Hybels, Andy Stanley, Erwin McManus, uh, you know, Ed Young, like all these great, great first world-class communicators. But the problem was, I started to, to pattern my stories after them. I started to speak like them. I would speed up at certain points and then slow down to deliver the point, just like they did. I would you know, tell the same jokes as them. I would do all that stuff because I wanted to be just like them. I wanted to, to figure out how can I pattern myself after them. And I finally got to a place where I realized that I was really just kind of a Frankenstein version of all these other guys. And I wasn't, I was, really wasn't me. And the problem is, is that when you and I, when we compare ourselves, it always puts contentment out of reach. Comparison always puts contentment just beyond you. When I start looking at the guys that I'm not, or the, the people who are doing things that I can't do, I'm no longer able to be content with who I am. It's just a little bit further. If only I could be a little bit more like that. If only my marriage could just be a little bit more like theirs. If only I parented my kids the way that they parented. And I lose contentment in who God has made me to be the way that I am right now. Now, I'm all for getting better and, and, and excelling and learning and all of those things. But not at the expense of missing out on what God is doing in me and through me right now. And I'm afraid that there are some of us in this room who when we look in the mirror, we struggle to recognize who's looking back at us because it just looks like all of our favorites. In fact, today, maybe if we're honest, like brutally honest, life has, is so crazy for you that you're beginning to wonder if you're really a lot more like Moses than you thought, that your world is, is being turned upside down where you're, you're wondering like, should I, should I just put everything in a basket and let it sail away? Your jobs are in turmoil your relationships are rocky, your kids are falling apart, and you may be tempted to wonder if you're floating in a basket somewhere nestled in the reeds. But I want to tell you this, that God has not forgotten you, nor has he neglected you. Moses was placed in a basket, but Moses was never abandoned because Moses' sister was always there watching, always there just a little bit in the distance. See, your story doesn't have to look exactly like someone else's for it to be used by God. Moses was placed in a basket, and yet something incredible happened. Now let's look back at our story, Exodus chapter 2, verse 5. It says, Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank, and she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then she, his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. And then Pharaoh's daughter responded with this. She said this, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. But God did something incredible here. In the midst of, of Moses' life, God provided for him because one day, these three women, Pharaoh's uh, daughter and her two attendants, decided that it was, it was bath day. 
and that they went down to the Nile River to bathe, and upon getting there, they see, they, they hear this, this crying thing in the water, and so she sends a servant to go get the baby out of the water. They look at it, and they're like, this is a Hebrew kid. What are we going to do? Miriam jumps in and says, I've got just a solution for you. I know somebody. I know a nursing mom. Could she help you? And in God's providence, or the way that God provides, Moses' own mother draws a salary for caring for her own baby. As messed up as this situation looks, God has redeemed that situation, and he's done something incredible through it. See, God uses painful situations to provide for Moses. And maybe right now, you've got a painful situation in your life. Like right now, you might be pretty sure that your spouse wants to trade you in for a newer model. Or maybe you wake up every day and you go to work at a job that you cannot believe that you are still there. And you're like, I-, I never dreamed I would be doing this. I only thought I would be here for a year at most. And then I'd be moving on to bigger and better things. And yet here you are. You wake up every day going to that. Or maybe you thought parenting was going to be way easier than this. Like you got this thing on lockdown. And it's just not nearly as much fun as you thought it was going to be. But it wasn't just provision that got Moses in this time, through this time. It was God also preparing Moses for what would come later in his life. From time to time, um, I will wear this, this bracelet here. Um, this bracelet is, is significant to me because friends of mine gave it to me before I left uh, our, our church in New Jersey. But the significance of this bracelet is even beyond just the fact that friends gave it to me. There's, there's some numbers printed on this, and they're actually uh, longitudinal and latitudinal lines. And these lines, uh, 39 degrees, 38 minutes, 34 seconds north, and 74 degrees, 10, 10 minutes, 50 seconds west, is the exact place in time when I, I crossed a pivotal decision in my life. See, some of you remember the story that uh, I grew up in a pastor's home, and my dad was a pastor, and um, you know, for 25 years, that's what I grew up witnessing and experiencing. I, I knew nothing else, in fact. But when I had just gotten married, Tiffany and I were living on Long Beach Island, New Jersey, um, which is very similar to a Siesta Key type environment, but just up north and not as clean and pretty and no palm trees and um, dirty water uh, and cold most of the year. So nothing like Siesta Key. But we were living in that environment, and I was a, I was a youth pastor at a, at a church I had just started. And another part of the story that I, I've shared with you guys is that my dad got very sick right about that time in life. And my dad began um, showing signs of Alzheimer's, early onset Alzheimer's at the age of 54. And in four years' time later, um, we would, I would lose my dad to Lewy body's disease. Now, however, in the very beginning, the start of that story, I'm a young man, super young man, like a baby. I shouldn't have even been married, but I was. And I was starting out my career as a pastor. I just got out of the water surfing with some teenagers, and I look at my, my cell phone. It was that Nokia, like, brick. You guys remember that one? And there was a text message from my sister that said, um, you need to call me. And I called, and she said, they fired daddy. Like the church that I grew up in one day just decided that he was no longer good enough. And in fact, there's a whole, you know, tons of backstory that was incredibly painful, more painful than I can even share or want to relive, truthfully. And I'll never forget sitting on the curb right by my surfboard still wet from the ocean, thinking, what did I sign up for? Like, if this is what's going to happen in 25, 30 years from now, for me, is this what I want to give my life to? And it was this moment of incredible pain. And I wish I could say, like, it just happened in that moment, and then everything got better from there. Actually, for the next four years, Tiffany and I struggled through so many different situations in life and so many different decisions, and we crossed so many different roads that we would have to look at and say, God, I don't know what you're doing here, but we're going to just continue. 
And this, this geographical point is significant to me because this is the point in time when I said, if the very same thing were to happen to me, if at 54 I'm sidelined by some sort of debilitating disease, fired by Hope City, sent off to pasture, would it be worth it to follow God? And I started thinking of people's names that, that I know that, that intersected with my parents' life, that intersected with our family, like, like Bill Cruft and, and John Parisi and Bob Tulin and Vita Tulin and, and Stella and all these other people that my family you know, grew up and my dad poured his life into theirs. Would it be worth it to travel through this pain so that I could one day know Matt? So that one day, Cesar and I could be friends. So that one day we could actually see this. Who even knew at this point in time? And I said, absolutely. In the midst of my pain, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm going to keep my eyes focused on you. And see, guys, sometimes, sometimes God works in mysterious ways and God works through really terrible situations that look like just a paper basket floating in a Nile River. And some of you are there right now. But I want you to know this, that it doesn't stop there. See, the basket seemed to be the final move to Moses' mom, right? To Moses' dad. Seemed like that was the last thing. Let's just set, let's set him to drift because, man, that is more. I can't even bear watching a soldier come and take my son's life. But before Moses could, could see God, before Moses could stand in front of Pharaoh, before Moses could receive the Ten Commandments, he had to first endure abandonment. He had to endure pain and isolation, and here's what they never taught me in Sunday school. But here's what I want to teach you. That sometimes, sometimes God allows you to go through something to get something done through you. That there are times in your life where you're going to have to go through something. You're going to have to endure a painful situation. You're going to have to look down the barrel of something that you do not want to see. So that one day, God can do something incredible through you. This is not popular. This isn't like, this is not health and wealth. This is not the thing where you're like, man, I'm just going to sign up to be, be a Christian because can't wait to get all that money. Can't wait to get all that prestige. Can't wait. No, maybe God's going to bring you through something so that one day he can do something through you. In fact, I know some of you in this room are in the early stages of Moses' life. You're slugging it out. Days are long. Emotions are running high, and it's scary for you. Your fear of the unknown is causing you to wonder about where God is. But what if we stopped comparing ourselves to other people, to what others have done, or what God's done through them, and we remain content with where God has us right now? Instead of focusing on what's happening to you, think about what God is doing in you. See, we're going to run into trouble every time when we focus on someone else's highlight reel and compare it to our outtakes. You know, those outtakes, the scenes that fall on the cutting room floor that nobody ever sees. Some of us have had those. The years maybe that you spent, you know, in school, and now you have that career, and everybody's like, man, how'd you get here? Well, nobody sees the, the days and the nights that you studied and you, you, you practiced, or the months of struggling and fighting with your spouse, and everybody looks at you and like, man, you got an incredible relationship but they don't see that the patience and the grace that you had to apply to that relationship to be where you are today. Or the tears, the prayers, and the conversations that parents have had over their children. See, it's a little bit like this picture here. You guys look at this picture and you're like, oh my gosh, the Gwesky family is like, they're amazing, they're perfect, they're so all the time, those family, those pictures are just incredible. What you don't know is that seconds before this, I was like this, get over here, Noah, stop touching her. Grace, look at their, look at their camera, look right here, I've got the selfie thing. How long do you want me to hold my arm like this? Come on, Leah, would you just cheese it up a little bit? Like, come on, like, take this picture, or I'm going to take your life. And then I'm like, ha. Ah. This, this is what, this is what happens. Like we compare our worst moments to the best moments. And we forget that there's actually a whole lot of worst moments behind this. See, comparison breeds jealousy. And jealousy strips contentment. And God never intended for you to live a life of comparison. It's easy for you to say, I'll never be like Moses. But I'm going to tell you today that you are never intended to be Moses. 
You were intended to be who God made you to be today. Billy Graham may be the most modern-day version of Moses that I can think of. Billy Graham was an incredible man who's responsible in leading over 2.5 million people to know Jesus He's been a spiritual advisor to countless presidents. In fact, he's prayed at every presidential inauguration from 1948 to 1996. That is an amazing thing. Billy Graham is a man that that God used in tremendous ways because he would travel from city to city uh, doing these things called crusades, these Billy Graham crusades, where he would get into the largest arena that that city had to offer, and people would come to listen to this man talk about Christ. In fact, when I was uh, eight or nine, I went to the Billy Graham crusade in Madison Square Garden in New York City, and the place was jammed, packed to hear this man talk about Jesus. But do you know what happened before this man reached hundreds and thousands of millions of people around the world? This man, Billy Graham, he walked door to door selling hairbrush, Fuller Brush Company. He was a door-to-door salesman. And he would walk up to a woman who was penniless and say, ma'am, you need to buy this brush. It's going to change your life. And then the door would slam. He'd go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one. You've got to wonder, like, what was Billy Graham thinking? A modern-day Moses going, God, what are you doing with my life? Like, what gives? See, contentment begins when comparison ends. Guys, you and I, we need to learn to not compare ourselves, but to be content with where God has us today. What if God is bringing you through something to prepare you for something? Like, do you think that Moses was laying in this basket on the Nile River and that anybody in their right mind would be like, man, I'd love to be Moses right now. Like, I would trade everything I've got to be this. Well, sure, if you base it on the highlight reel. But if it's just on that moment, not a chance, no way. See, in fact, nobody wanted Moses' life story at this point in time. Sunday school may have done us a disservice if you miss out on the fact that God works through ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Like Jesus' own best friends, his disciples. What were they? Fishermen, tax collectors. There was a doctor in the mix. Just normal people. And they did amazing things. Or the Apostle Paul who wrote over half of the New Testament. He started out as a person that persecuted that 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 disturbed the christian church that he he sent people to their death and yet the the gospel advanced through him guys i share all these things because i believe that you and i we need to stop comparing ourselves to all these other people and saying i could never do that like god doesn't want to do anything through me and i want to tell you that god wants to do something incredible in you right now that where you are today, this is where God has you. Don't miss out on that just because it feels like you're stuck in a basket somewhere. Don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie that it doesn't matter, that you're not good enough, that God can't use you. See, when you and I learn that, that it, it is not about what God, um, it's not about us, but it's what God does through us. Your relationships will change, your kids will change, your marriage will change, and your happiness will increase. Men, just imagine with me for a second what would happen if you stopped comparing your marriage to every other thing that you see on Instagram of that picture-perfect, cutesy couple comparing your spouse's worst attributes to somebody else's best. It's going to cause you to grow toxic in your relationship, and it will do nothing good but leave you feeling bitter and angry. What if instead of comparing your marriage, you actually just started covering your marriage in prayer and allowed grace to win the day? Or maybe you go to work every single day and you don't understand why you're not a manager yet. Like you just actually don't understand why you haven't been promoted. Or worse yet, why did she get the promotion? And you begin to compare everything that you are to everything that she is and it can leave you feeling angry and jealous and bitter. What if instead of comparing, you just started looking for ways to serve your coworkers? Because what does Jesus say? He says, whoever wants to be the greatest among you needs to be the servant of all. What if you found ways to be the servant of everybody in your world? Imagine how invaluable you would be to that, that organization. See, guys, if we can take our eyes off of ourselves and our accomplishments and keep them on God, you and I are in a position to make a difference, even if right now, you feel like you are trapped in one of these in this basket. 
See, you might be in a position in your life where you are the most dependent on God right now for absolutely everything. And I think he says, that's okay. Like, what if that's actually the position that God wants you in before he can do some incredible things through you? See, one of the things that I know, and I think you know this too, is that success gets the attention of people, but character pleases the heart of God. And character is formed in basket moments. See, this is one of the reasons why I'm so excited for Serve Day on July 15th. We're going to be getting out of our seats here. We're going to get into the streets here. We're going to get actually into the parking lot here. And we're going to make a difference here at Tatum Ridge. We're going to go to one of the homes in, uh, of this single mom who's an incredible woman raising an incredible daughter. And we just want to help take care of them. We want to walk alongside of them and actually partner with them like we've said we're going to from the beginning of this church. See, we're moving the focus from ourselves. It's not about me. It's not about what we're doing. It's not about what we can do for you. But what can we do for other people? What can God do through us and use us in our city? See, if God caused, if God used a baby born during a national genocide, cast aside in a basket, imagine what God can do through you. Imagine what God can do through this church. In our, in our city, in our town, or in your own home. 